It's going to be an emotional night at the Vitality Stadium on Wednesday evening when the town return to take on AFC Bournemouth in a rearranged, rescheduled game after the incidents of December the 16th and the aftermath of that. To preview AFC Bournemouth versus the Luton Town, alongside me, I've got the Lutonian journalist James Cunliffe. Jimbo, this is more than just football, this one. It is. Um, yeah, a lot, lot of respect for Bournemouth and the way that uh, they came out of that game. And um, yeah, we uh, we'll all sort of pay the respects of everything that everyone deserves from that. And then, um, but there is a there is a small matter of a, a massive football match. So got to get a head switched on for that. And we'll preview that football match after this intro. Hello everyone, welcome along to another episode of the Luton Town Supporters Trust podcast. As I said before the intro, it's myself and James for this one and we're looking at the second coming of AFC Bournemouth versus Luton Town. Jimbo, we take we kind of highlighted that there's a football match to be played, but we're all going back to the scene that no one wants to remember, but nobody can forget. And in light with that, we need to give some need to give the players a little bit of slack here because it's not necessarily automatic that their heads will be on a game of football here. Maybe certainly not right at the start. I know that the professional, I know that they're well paid and everything, but this was their mate who they thought had died. And if you think back to that day in December, Issa Kabore, the last time he saw the football pitch there, he was praying on it. This It's not just automatic turn up and play here. There's a lot more to this one. Absolutely. You, you can't underestimate the psychological impact of everything that happened on that day. I mean, you know, if, if every Luton fan of the world is still talking about it, really, aren't they? And, you know, we're all so glad that Tom's around. And not only that, he's just had a baby this week. So congratulations, Tom. That's um, going to be some sleepless nights, which I'm sure he uh, will, you know, relish after what happened at, uh, on that day. Uh, it was it was shocking. Um so yeah, there there could be some things that crop up. You've got to, I mean, I always forget this, um, even though they're much younger than I am now, footballers. But they're just they're young they're young lads in their twenties, most of them. Um and uh, you know, as professional as you wanna be, you don't know the sort of impacts that these things are gonna happen. So um hopefully uh it hopefully it's it's as minimal as possible, um, may, maybe none, um, perhaps because of the good news that ever since with Tom, then that might um, have lessened the impact somewhat, but you never know. There is going to have to be a football match played um, and Luton are running on empty as it is, but yeah, cut them some slack where you can. Yeah, if someone has a bad game here, don't just write it off or come out with any kind of nonsense on social media. Appreciate the fact that this could all be psychological as much as physical, as much as technical or anything like that. It's it's not a night that anyone's necessarily looking forward to. It's a night that we've all got to go through again and it will bring back those memories. I'm not personally looking forward necessarily to going back in because it is just going to dredge up all those memories. Tom is expected to be there as well. Hopefully that acts as inspiration for the boys like it has done when he's been around them previously. But it's just not automatic, this one. This is... This was life and death, and thankfully it's life rather than the alternative, but we didn't know that at the time. And um, yeah, a little bit of sort of understanding of the situation is needed. Should this go wrong, let's hope it doesn't, and we're going to preview this in a normal manner. But I think it's important to keep that in everyone's sort of minds, really. And I'm sure when we're there, and we'll, we'll, we'll know f from our own experiences how we feel in the stands, just how it will be, because if we feel eerie and everything else then that's just going to transmit onto the onto the players as well yeah possibly um i do think that there's there's i think there're probably some positives to come out of this because um the the mutual respect that the two clubs have have for each other now 
is going to be a big show of unity at the start of the game and as it should be the Bournemouth fans were incredible on the day have been incredible since and everything that they've done um, absolutely proper uh, bunch of uh, supporters there that uh, are credit to that club so there's going to be um, if any there will be heightened emotions but hopefully it'll be positive ones um, at the start and that probably be a good way to to start things off obviously the, when the football kicks in yeah fair enough support your team and, and get behind the boys uh, whichever team you, you're supporting on the day obviously this is a Luton podcast we want we want it uh, implore the Luton fans to be as noisy as possible and I'm sure they will be um, uh, like you say especially if, if if Tom's there and um, everything that's happened to him positively in the last a uh, couple of months especially but also this week because that's um, some some massive news to have your first child and uh, yeah I remember what it was like and it was um, yeah mad <laughs> it's, it, nothing prepared you for that I can tell you no uh, yeah so hopefully it all it all goes okay yeah the Bournemouth fans been absolutely superb if you're going on a Bobber's coach to this game you'll have that free of charge courtesy of the Bournemouth fans who have raised money for coach travel for Luton fans who are going to this game. So absolute kudos to everyone involved with any of the donations with regards to that and all of the donations to the British Heart Foundation that's been organised as well. There'll be a presentation on the pitch, I believe, at half time uh, between the Trust and uh, the Bournemouth uh, equivalent. And yeah, we're more than happy to uh, play our part in um, remembering it the right way, really. Yeah, that's that's quality from the the Bournemouth fans, and uh, you know, as uh, as it should be, f- you know, football comes together in those sorts of moments, doesn't it? And it's really important that they do because it's just a game at the end of the day. And um, you know, what happened was more than that, much much more, m- far more important. And uh, everyone recognises it at the time, still recognises it. Um, but it's it's going to be a, a nice way to cap off a, f- a sort of difficult few months I guess to to honour the, the the people that have done so uh, you know done so there's so many good things from from the whole situation um, you know uh, particularly the you know the medical staff as well they're they're the they're the real heroes of the scenario isn't it um, the, the people from both clubs um, and the, the paramedics that were there phenomenal work really so um they deserve as much credit as anyone else. Yep. And if Philip Billing comes off the bench like he did in that first game, all four sides will be giving him a standing ovation. Yeah, top. Uh, yeah. I don't care what colour shirt he's wearing. He gets a standing ovation any time he's in my company yet. Um, that's for sure. Football then. When we went there, they were in some serious, insane form. Oh, yeah. They were the hottest team in the country. I mean, we'd just been beaten by Manchester City, but Bournemouth were trumping them for form, weren't they? They were right up there with Liverpool and everything. Not the case now, though. Form has completely dropped off in 2024. Their only wins against Burnley. You can't really use that as a form guide these days either, can you? No, not taking anything away from that win. I don't even think they were brilliant in that game. James, I think Burnley had their chances to get something out of that, but... I mean, Burnley are even more professional at shooting themselves in the foot than what we are, aren't they? So, um, yeah, what, what are you expecting from Bournemouth here? It's a lesser version of what we got the first time around. Bearing in mind it was 1-1 when that catastrophe happened. Yeah, I mean, they they have dropped off. They've only had the one win in this calendar year in the Premier League. They, they won one in the FA Cup in that period. But, um, yeah, it, look, it looks like they've dropped off results-wise. Um, but... I mean, the form that they were in the last time Luton went there was so good that they were relegation peers of Luton at the time before that run. And then the run they went on, that's basically um, secured their Premier League status for me. I think they're safe as houses. I mean, I know they're in the bottom half, so it's a it's a winnable game. But uh, they're absolutely safe as houses as far as I'm concerned. Um, so they're, they're, they're in no danger of going down and that can give you a freedom or you know it's the old cliche of of um 
in already being on the beach. I think that's a bit too early to be saying that. To be honest, we're in we're in March, and I'm still wearing a coat, so no no, no chance of that. And I think the sort of the magnitude and the um, the uniquely special atmosphere of this game is it, we'll have their players up for it anyway. So I don't think that um, it's it, it's wise to chuck that sort of accusation around whatsoever. So they've still got some very good players. I mean, um, you know, for only having won one game this season. The, the front four that started at the weekend, uh, if they click, that, that's, a, that's a frightening front four for a club in the bottom half. Well, you know, even in the mid, mid table of the Premier League, pretty good. Yeah, this year, not this season, of course, uh, slip of the tongue. There, yeah, you don't need, if they're on the beach, you could surf in puddles the amount of rain we've had this <laughs> this week, couldn't you? You don't need the beach for uh, for any of that. Yeah, uh, one of those players then would be Dominic Solanke. Yep. He got the equaliser at their place that we've all forgotten about now because of what happened. He was in real scoring. For, I mean, it was his form largely that was, when his form was strong, Bournemouth's form was strong. And he's kind of gone quiet in recent times and they've gone quiet in recent times it's a kind of mirror image isn't it if he plays well or scores they win if he doesn't play well or doesn't score they don't win he didn't score against Sheffield United at the weekend they didn't win so really and truly the key to this game is keeping him quiet as quiet as we possibly could we obviously at the first half at their place in the first game he was as quiet as anything but he still managed to score from that set piece just before the game was suspended. Um, if we can keep him quiet, just looking at his scoring ratio and their win ratio, if we keep him quiet, we go a long way to winning this game or having the chance to win this game, sorry. Yeah, I mean, he's a massive threat. He's getting touted as for big money moves and the away to, I think, West Ham's the latest one he's got linked with at the weekend. He's better off staying where he is, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he, he is, he's been in goal scoring form of his life, I think. But I was looking at his stats this season and the longest run he's gone, the longest barren run he's had. I don't like this. Is three games. And uh, the weekend was his third game without scoring. So, um, you know, that's ominous for a, for a team like Luton who basically don't have a defence um, <laughs> because they're all injured. Uh, it is ominous. So if they can keep him quiet, that would be a hell, hell of a um, hell of a jump towards getting anything from that game. If that is his record, if you're watching this, Andoni Iriola, just drop him. <laughs> yeah. just, just save him. Rest, Sub- him. Rest him. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. Doesn't need to play this game. <laughs> there is talk actually, James, that he's playing with an injury. He didn't play in the cup game against Leicester, which you would have thought at the time Bournemouth would have been all out to win the FA Cup because they, like you say, they're safe. So if he's if he's not playing in that, there's got to be something something up. And that was only two weeks ago, wasn't it? So maybe he's not fully fit. I mean, hellfire, we know all about that. But um, that would be handy if he's not if he's not fully fit, or if he's there's a period of this game that he doesn't play. Then um, Unal might be the next focus. He was the one who scored the last gasp equaliser on Saturday. They brought him in on loan in January. One of the few moves that was done in January, obviously found his feet now. Uh, I suppose any striker has got to be a threat against Luton at the minute because like you say, our paucity of defenders that are fit is getting lower and lower and lower. Yeah, let's be honest, uh, Luton weren't keeping them out when they had a full after defenders to, to begin with. I mean, it's, it's. Uh, I think um, I've long since kissed goodbye to any dreams of clean sheets. It's just going to be, you have to outscore a team to, 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 to win now. Luckily, Luton have scored in 15 consecutive Premier League games. So they're going to have the same sort of worries um, of keeping Luton out, particularly uh, once you tick over to the 75th minute mark and the amount of late goals that Luton have scored as uh, exemplified by, by the weekend at, at Palace. Um, that was um, as late as they come really. And so that gives opposition team a lot to uh, be concerned about, um, particularly set pieces as well, but crosses. I know the cross that set up the goal for Corley Woodrow was from Andrus Townsend, but um, Doughty is still top of the tree for crosses in the Premier League by some distance, actually, over Kieran Trippier in, um, in uh, Newcastle, uh, which tells you a lot about Luton's um, lines of attack, even if uh, perhaps Doughty is one of those players that really is running on empty. Um, you know, if you can whip a ball in and you don't have to run past the player, then 
that's going to be a useful thing to have in your locker. Yeah, you're not wrong. That's for sure. Um, the other one may be worth a mention. Um, Cliver, he scored the opening goal against uh, Burnley last weekend. I mean, just the name alone tells you that he should be quality. You know, his old man weren't bad at sticking a ball mm-hmm. in the onion bag, was he? Um, so, yeah, he, he he seems to play more wider, though. So he's probably something that maybe Kabore is going to have to um, worry about. But at least Kabore is fit. So at least we can, you know, at least we can match up fitness with fitness there. Yeah, and fresh as well, because he didn't, uh, once he came back from the AFCON, he didn't really play for a, for a while. So, um, yeah, that that is a positive. Um, at least we can have one uh, defender who can run all day. And um, But, you know, by the looks of that block that he put in at Sellers Seller, Park at the weekend, a player that's going to do everything he can to, you know, firstly try and get Luton results, but probably try and atone for the, the mistake perhaps against Aston Villa, which at that block went a long way to doing so um you know that you know it, it does show that the, the, the there's fight in this team and he's not even a he's not even a full looting player he's a lone player so if you've got lone players coming in doing that um, you know as we've seen with Sambi who's who's the same he put in a wonderful block before he got injured so um it, it just shows you what this team's all about really and yeah whatever team they manage to rustle up and field um on the south coast or on Wednesday is going to be one that's going to at least try. Oh yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. There's three threats from the opposition. Then there are others, but they're the ones that we think might be the most dangerous. Uh, let's switch it back to Luton James. Um, where are we with team selection? Well, obviously we're doing this before Rob's pre-match presser as we always do. Um, You're taking your boots and you. I am, yeah. And if we get down to me, um, thankfully my back's recovered from how it was on Saturday. Otherwise, I'll have been joining the injury list. Um, but yeah, I mean, where do we go from here? I mean, the vibes on Saturday were that Ted and Mengi may be okay, albeit not fully fit. So might may need to be monitored. I'm always wary when I see ice around knees, the mm. gay boss show. And in the space of three days, Annie was a, out beforehand anyway wasn't he he was all stripped off to come off against Man City never did and then missed the Aston Villa game completely so he's obviously already injured prior to that my senses are we're not going to see Gay Bosho in this game so at the very best we're looking at back three of Hashioka Mengi Burke that's assuming Ted's okay to go again yeah, I, I, if if he is, then yes. Um, there was talk uh, before the Palace game of whether Luton can switch to a, a back four, um, a traditional back four, and Edwards said yes, that that's one of the things that they can do and have have practice and indeed have used this season as well. So And finished uh, the Palace game. With- uh, yeah, absolutely. So it may be a case of needs must. What that does then to Luton's uh, attacking abilities is is probably the more is a knock-on effect isn't it because the the three at the back with the wing backs works in Luton's favour so much but you you, ha- you can't just play the one way anyway uh, you know if teams stop that um, then you can have to figure out another way so it's right that they do have that in their locker and work on it um, and it may just be that formation it has to be dictated by who's available. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, we're not. Are we expecting Eli and Sambi? We're not, are we? I'm not. I mean, that was another question that was asked in the villa in the Palace pre-match, and uh, Edwards was. It, it, it seemed that that wasn't going to happen for the Bournemouth game. It was probably a bit too far, and he didn't necessarily use the word setback but he took a big sigh and a deep breath that that it's it's a frustrating one because they're sort of so close but they can't quite push them enough to get them closer and in both hamstring injuries as well and particularly um Sambi's one and how long he was out for um and also the, the 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 championship season before last for Eli at the end of that when we all saw the effects of Eli coming on when he clearly wasn't fit in that um, playoff semi-final second leg. Um, 
it, it almost says to me, don't rush them. The two big games, I think, as we highlighted in the in the Palace preview, were the Palace game and the Forest one, whereas this one is the game in hand and you'd want to win it, but because those two are closer and Bournemouth are pretty much safe, you'd rather get results if if you know if you had to get the results against Palace and Forest and, and not this one. So I wouldn't risk them necessarily. Yeah, the listen, the Forest game's getting bigger with every passing second, isn't it? That's um, that's for sure. Yeah, it it didn't sound particularly great. And you're right, I don't think we should risk either of them actually. Um it's certainly if there's a chance that they, they could play against Forest without being risked here, why would you risk them? I mean, where Sambi's concerned, if he wants to give Clicker a rest, which would be understandable because he was out for so long and he's now played a fairly large run of games in a short sp- a short space of time. You've got Pelly who could go in alongside Ross, assuming Ross is okay. I mean, who knows how he's going to be after that broken nose. Yeah. Yes, he finished the game well, but, you know, it, it's not necessarily easy, is it? But I'm sure he'll play, but... Someone get him a Phantom of the Opera mask and get him playing and dose him up with whatever um, sanctioned <laughs> drugs you're allowed to. Uh, I, I imagine there's plenty of that going around at the moment, really. They're going to have to patch up so many players, it's untrue. Yeah, indeed. Um, so he, he's he got one or two options in midfield, hasn't he? Uh, should Sam be not be fit? We think Morris will be okay up front. Uh, apparently it was just cramp. Uh, when he was feeling his hamstring, I must admit, when he went down and started feeling his hamstring, I was like, oh, Christ, because that particular muscle is killing us this season. Because it, it was Morris, when Woodrow scored, it was Morris on the ground, wasn't it? Yeah, it didn't move. Yeah, I thought it was. Um, it did look worrying because, I mean, he got up enough to go and then celebrate. So that would suggest to me that it's not particularly an injury, but, you know, all these things count. And <laughs> three games in a week is a massive ask in the Premier League anyway. Uh, if Luton had a full strength squad uh, and we're nowhere near or even close uh, you mentioned Corley there does he start this one um, I, I, so I suppose it depends on the defensive formation if they have a, f- um, a back four and, and what they what they play like then it might suit more of a a partnership up top with Morris and Woodrow um, I wouldn't be against that they know each other very well they've played with it with each other at Burnley. Um I'd be surprised actually, because I, I thought that Hashioka might start at Salas Park in, in Paris uh, against Palace and he didn't. Um that was after his fantastic performance against Villa and um you know, Woodrow's obviously got the the, the winner, uh, not the winner. It feels like a winner, doesn't it? He absolutely <laughs> it's not did, a winner. Yeah. It was a it was a leveler at, at Palace, which is massive. Um, but whether he comes in to to the thinking, I'm not so sure. I would probably say no. That's nothing against Corley, obviously. It's just um, that's the that's the way it's been going for him this season. His magic moments come from the bench when the clock hits 90 and he's like it's like Cinderella and a pumpkin it just switches completely at that point and he scores against Norwich scores against Everton scores against Palace and if he can score against Bournemouth in that fashion because he's going to play isn't he whether he starts or not there's no way we're getting through without using all five subs in this game whoever those five people on the bench are I mean like you intimated I'm fully expecting my call up at some point and <laughs> um, you know that that then we know we're in problems when I get that. Uh, <laughs> that that is for sure. Um, Townsend crosses are important mm. in this game. Yeah, they will be. I thought he would start to, at Palace, um, and for whatever reason he didn't. You know, Chio. Yeah, did, I suspect he's got to be rested, Chio. Yeah, I think because so. they tried to rest him against Villa, didn't they? Yeah. And he managed to get rested before all of five minutes. So it, it's there. I mean. Villa as well with that high line you'd have Chio's pacing behind if he didn't need resting all day long wouldn't you he has to be rested he wasn't overly influential on Saturday anyway he yeah. looked like a guy who's who needs to go to the petrol station and get a refill didn't he so that would be the obvious switch Townsend for Chio Townsend played down that right hand side in the first game there and was heavily involved in the goal or in the build up to the move that got us the goal um it seems like an obvious one. And also, he can keep the ball. The last thing we need to be doing in this week is three lots of chasing teams around a pitch where it's pissing down the rain and they're going to be heavy pitches anyway. 
if we can keep the ball for a little bit and just reserve some energy yeah Townsend's ideal at that I think that's that's the key part of the equation as to whether he plays everybody knows he can cross a ball and set pieces and crossing going to be so important particularly Bournemouth ain't that great at, at corner kicks um you know whether he takes them or not is, is a different matter but I think the key thing just going off how inaccurate the passing was particularly in the first half at Palace um you, you need a a player of his ilk to come in and uh, just make sure those little five yard passes are going to the right people because all these things build up in a game and if there's a string of them string of bad passes misplaced passes the the wrong to go it just kills your momentum and Luton are going to need momentum in this they're going to need to like get every sort of ounce of <laughs> um mystery that they can throw at this all the all the football mysteries that they you can you can manage to 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 attack this game and and try and get something because it's it is a winnable game but um yeah it's it, it's asking a lot of of the same thirteen players to keep doing it again and again and again um you know ultimately we just hope that they can get through it that's all it is survival for this week and pick up as many points as we can get um. Yeah, the other reason I like Townsend is they're good on the counter-attack Bournemouth. Um, They don't necessarily play for the counter-attack. They're quite a possession-based side or more of a possession-based side under uh, Iriola than they would have been under Scott Parker in particular. (laughs) But they're still good on the um, counter-attack. They did have a couple of counter-attacks in the uh, first game. So if Cabore's bombing on, just Townsend's comfort on the ball, sometimes Chia can have a heavy touch and lose it. And if if Cabore has gone past him, the counter-attack behind would be well and truly on. Yes, they've both got the pace to get back, but you always want someone in the right area. So if Townsend could keep hold of that ball just a little bit, I'd be surprised if he's not used in this game. I can't see a situation where he's used straight away against Knott's Forest because they're just going to sit deeper, right? Mm. So we're going to need the pace and the movement and everything else. This just feels like an ideal time for Townsend. And I tell you what it is an ideal time for. That 30, 35 yard banger you've been talking absolutely. about. Absolutely. Please bring that out. Yeah, absolutely. He's the pressure with that. Um, yeah, if you can't get round them or anything like that, um, come up with some some of the goods. I, I, I like Ties at Townsend for this game. I, I, I do think that he, I'd like to see him on the on the pitch from the start because, um, you know, he, he's had to bide his time for a while on the bench. And so even though given his age, he's fresh legs <laughs> in a team where there ain't any. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he went off 55th minute against Villa, came on in the 87th minute against Bristol Palace. So he's played to what, 63 minutes, give or take, in the last two games. I mean, we're crying out for people who's happily played just 63 minutes in a fit. So, uh, yeah, kind of like Townsend in that one. And um, that is, we've highlighted it already. That is the way in, in this game, crossing the ball. Um, they're not great. At crosses, they're particularly not great at set pieces. We saw that in the first game. Two minutes was it on the clock when Elijah scored when the goalkeeper came flapping at a cross that he was never getting in in a month of Sundays. There won't potentially there won't be any Elijah to score this time, but Morris is every bit as good in the air, so that's absolutely fine. Um Pepper them with crosses. They're missing Senesi, or at least I think they're missing Senesi. He didn't play at the weekend and he if you're going up against Sheffield United, you're going up against a physical side, you'd want your physical centre-halves. So if he didn't play in that, I'm assuming he's injured. So that would be Mepham, who will be there, who's more of a ball player. Um, so get these crosses in. Get them in as much as possible uh, and wait for something to drop. And it, and, it, and it will do. We saw the patience of it on Saturday, really. But yeah, just get those crosses in. Absolutely, yeah. If if ever there was a game plan for it, uh, it, it it's that because you're not gonna probably grind them down with a lot of running, um, uh, and they aren't particularly useful in the air as that first game showed. So yeah, that that's the, I mean as it has been for so many times, for so many occasions. That's that's the that's the route, um, and if it works, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Absolutely, that yeah. Uh, keep Solanke as quiet as possible. And get those crosses in the box. That is the the key thing here. It, it really is. Um, relegation picture then. Win this game, we're out the bottom three. 
that's a known. Now, does that make this game not must win? Because it's not now, is it? Because we're with, with within one result of Knott's Forest, whatever happens here. But obviously we win. We go into the Forest game knowing that a draw keeps us out of the bottom three going into the international break. And given that the energy reserves are running low, any time that we don't need to win to stay out of the bottom three will be happy days. So are you looking at this as I really want to win here or, or would a point be absolutely fine? Well, I'll take a point. The win puts it in your hands then, doesn't it? And that's what you want at this stage of the season because uh, with a point, you're obviously closer. With a defeat, you're still within a, a, a victory of going above Forest, particularly as against Forest. But that, that, and I'm not, I'm not saying this, this is what Forest would do. Um, we'll talk about that in the preview and we'll look at a little bit closer what they might do after this result. But the option to stink the place out and only needing a draw, trying to nick a win is is there for Forrest. Whereas if you can win at Bournemouth and go above them, they've got to come out and try and do something. And then that opens it up a lot more. So you'd rather that. Um, but, you know, I'd I'd take a, a point on the road um, and then set it up for a massive game against Forrest. All of them are going to be massive. All of them are going to be tight and uh, tense. Um, and these two, no more so. Yep, it's all set up for a wonderful night after all of the sort of reflections of what went before um, before the game. Um, massive, massive, massive game for us. Not not necessarily for Bournemouth. No. Let's hope they're um, as hospitable uh, if for this game as they were charitable during uh, the stages of the last game and give us the three points, actually. And come on, lads. We've got this mutual bond now, haven't we? <laughs> we want to be in the same division next season, don't we? You've got to come to our place as well. Six points would help us out. No end to do that, of course, I jest. They're not going to do that. They'll be professional till the end and um, I wouldn't expect any different. But Christ, if we can win this game, the cat and the pigeons definitely come together then. Listen, if you can win this game with barely any players um, going into that massive game against Forest, it's, it's it, the lift. We, we were talking about the, the lift that the, the Corley Woodrow's goal at Palace gave anyway, but it'd be just skyrocketing after that. And you, you would just believe you can do anything after that. The, the psychological impact of any result now in this run-in is so important. And if you could be on the right side of it, you just feel that everything you touch will turn to gold. Um, it's a big ask. It is a big ask, but it's not out of the question. Not in the slightest. No, we can take confidence from the fact that Sheffield United got a point there, can't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's a result that stands out to me. And Burnley, for the most part, they were the better side against Bournemouth last week. Uh, but in true Burnley style, decided to shoot themselves in the foot. That's one thing. If someone scores against us, in this, can someone just score a bloody worldie rather than yeah. us shooting ourselves in the foot yeah. um, or giving a goal away? You know, we'll come on to our score predictions in a moment, but please, you know, stay in the game. Then the emotion of the occasion is, is going to have everyone's adrenaline going. So I don't think there'll be a problem with regards to sort of um, being up for it or anything like that. I don't think there'll be a flatness. There might be a sort of caution because of what we alluded to at the start of the podcast where they're going back to the scene of the um, incident. But that's where the fans come in, isn't it? Lift lift the boys as much as they possibly can do. And I'm sure we will do that. So, uh, yeah, huge, 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 huge night of Premier League football. Um, how does it finish? What's your score prediction? Well, it's going to be goals. Because, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the count rule out clean sheets. Uh, I think for Luton um, so I'm going to go for a I think it'd be a 2-2 to be honest Desmond 2-2 for Jimbo um, yeah one less for me I don't know I thought we'd win the game down there the first time around even though they were in fantastic form I just had that feeling that they play to our strengths very nicely the set piece thing and everything else and we've still got Ross Barkley who can just pull a rabbit out of a hat at any moment. So I'm going for a town win in this one, 2-1. We only win league games 2-1 apart from 
<laughs> Newcastle and Brighton. So um, yeah, no two one two one Luton. And my God, if if the scenes at the end of Crystal Palace were um, great, if the full full time whistle goes with Luton two one up, limbs in the away end are going to be incredible. I'm not sure if my back will be able to um, <laughs> go through it all again. Yeah, you want to take some protection for that. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, well, I obviously hope that your results is the one that actually comes in and not mine. Either way, we'll take either of them. It'll put us in a great position. Going into Saturday, and uh, can't, we've called these games huge. I, we're going to have to find another word for for that one because um, whatever happens here, that's season defining, isn't it? On Saturday, um, if you are going to the game in the away end, or if you're watching this as a home fan, I'm sure you're fully aware of uh, what's going on before the game, things like that. If you're kind of worried about going back, particularly if you're a Luton fan who's going back there for the first time, there are going to be people on hand that you can talk to. And um, if you've got any sort of concerns whatsoever, do take them up. It's really not a weakness or anything like that. We all experienced something we didn't want to experience, didn't know how to experience and really hope we never have to experience ever again. So if that help is on offer and you feel like you need it, if you feel apprehensive or anything at any time over the course of the evening, then do take up that help. For further information, you can check out the Luton Town Supporters Trust Twitter feed or indeed the Cherries Trust one. All of the information is going to be on there in the lead up to the game. And that is a very, very, very um, welcome thing that Bournemouth are putting on for all supporters. As I say, um, we want to forget what happened in December. We just can't. No, uh, but... Also want to try and remember that um, Tom's Tom's still here with us, and that's uh, that's the main thing. And the uh, fantastic work that people did there, uh, and everything that Bournemouth have done um, in support as well, and that's uh, that's hugely to their credit. You know, well done, well done, Bournemouth. There's um, there's a bond there between two clubs, which is going to last a long time, I think. Yeah, there is indeed. At half time, the trust are going to make a presentation to the Cherries Trust in line with that and our thanks for everything that they've done, both on that day in December, every day since then, and uh, all of the arrangements they've put in place for us to hopefully enjoy the evening on Wednesday. Of course, those of us that had tickets first time round have got free entry into this game. Again, you kind of expect two classy clubs to do that, but it wasn't. They didn't have to. But they've decided to do that, so full credit to to them and everything that's going on. As I say, keep an eye on the social media feeds of both clubs, both trusts, and you'll find out exactly what's going on ahead of the game. One other thing to flag up, as we spoke about when we had him on the podcast last week, Mark Crowther will be cycling from Kenworth Road to the Vitality Stadium in one day, 124 Ooh. miles Ooh. in one day. and if. If it, if I've not checked the weather, but if it's anything like Sunday in particular, where it lashed with rain all day, that is going to be a nasty, nasty trip. So he's raising money just for the British Heart Foundation for this game. He's already done the um, Bournemouth game for his cycle, his normal season cycle. So he's just going for the British Heart Foundation for this game. If you can contribute anything at all towards this cause he's desperate to get over a thousand pounds to the british heart foundation and we would love to help him get over that mark so if you've got any pennies uh, that you can spare him please do so he's he's going to go through the mill on um, wednesday for a worthy cause and if, if you if you see mark down there uh please do go up to him and congratulate him because uh, that will be an absolutely incredible effort yeah absolutely well We'll put the link to to that fundraiser in the show notes for this podcast. But yeah, it, yeah, incredible. I don't, I don't know how you'd even begin to. I mean, he does it all the time. There's he rides all over the place. But you know, for us mere mortals, I don't know how anyone manages to ride that much distance. But it is to his credit. He's quite close to the to the to the target that he wants to set to, for that. But obviously, it's all it's such a great cause. Tom Locke, who's been championing them ever since um, the incident and everything. So um, it's, it's, it's one, um, pun, in, pun intended, very much close to everyone's hearts. Speaking of which, it takes 15 minutes to learn how to do CPR. If there's one thing you take away from this game of football on Wednesday, forget the, for the, the 90 minutes. During those 90 minutes, five people around the country will have a cardiac arrest. That's the average time. 
at the average that it is, please take the 15 minutes to learn how to do CPR. British Heart Foundation website. It's simple, easy to follow video, and you never, ever know might be needed to save someone's life. So if we can take anything away from this game of football, win, lose or draw, uh, let's do that. Let's. Uh, Tom is right behind this cause. He's championing this cause and quite rightly so. So let's do our little bit and um, let's learn CPR. As I say, it's 15 minutes out of your day uh, and it's very, very, very worthy. You just don't know when that might be needed. Yeah, absolutely. That is it for this episode of the podcast. Thanks once again to everything that the Bournemouth fans have done for the Luton fans ahead of this game. We really, really do appreciate it. Thanks for you for watching or listening, however it is that you've consumed this podcast. Please do keep subscribing. Our numbers are going up all the time, but more importantly, these podcasts this week, they're coming thick and fast. And if you don't want to miss one of them, if you subscribe, you'll know exactly when each one drops. Give us your score predictions. Not a huge amount of time to do that with this being a midweek game, but we will shout out anyone who gets the correct score. No one got 1-1 against Crystal Palace. I think there's a lot of optimism that Luton would win that game. and uh, So no 1-1 one -one scores, so no shout outs from that one. But yep, yeah, let us have your score predictions and all of your comments. We do read them. We try to reply to as many of them as we can do. Thanks for keeping me company, mate. Really, really appreciate that. No bother. Yep. Let's hope they that we have got a positive result to to talk about after after Wednesday. As as better or if not better than uh, the Palace one. Indeed so. Yep. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks to the High Town Club for hosting the podcast, to Sean Grant and the Wolfgang for our intro music as always, and to Ed Smith Creative for all the designs that you see on set. From James and myself until we come along to review. What's a huge night of Premier League football? Come on, you hatters. Actually, you, everyone in it has got this massive soul.